Welcome, YouTubers, to another episode in my Grammar Hero series. In today's video, I'm going to be working out 16 practice test questions that should closely mirror what you'll see in the arithmetic reasoning subtest of the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, that is the ASVAB, as well as the pre-screening internet-delivered computer adaptive test, that is the PICAT. In order to get the most out of this video, you'll want to pause the video after I read a question, attempt to work out the question on your own, and then resume playing the video to check your solution. In the description of this video, I'll include timestamps that will be associated with each question. Next to the timestamp will be the topic that the question's testing, as well as a link to video where I discuss that topic in greater detail. So if at any point you get stuck in this video, just look in the description and find those links to my additional resources. Similarly, I want to mention that on the ASVAB and PICAT, you will not be permitted to use a reference sheet or a calculator. So as you take this practice test, try not to use any of those resources. Finally, I want to mention that on my YouTube channel, I have a playlist called ASVAB slash PICAT Math Bootcamp. In that playlist, there are more than 500 practice test questions. If you work uh, through all those practice tests from start to finish, you should have no trouble on test day. And for that reason, I do not recommend that you spend any money whatsoever on tutoring. And with all that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get started with today's video. All right, this uh, first question says, if a single box of screws weighs one and five, six pounds, then how much does 12 boxes weigh? So for this one, we're simply gonna do one and five, six, which is the weight of one box of screws. And we're gonna multiply that by 12 to figure out how much 12 boxes of screws weigh. Uh, that said, some of you are probably looking at this and saying, wow, how do I get started? I don't know how to deal with multiplying a mixed number by a whole number. Well, the key to solving this one is to convert both one and five sixths and as well as 12 to improper fractions. And as it happens, that's pretty easy to do. To write one and five sixths as an improper fraction, we're gonna keep our denominator the same. That is to say, we're gonna keep this six the same. To find our numerator, we're gonna do one times six, which is six plus five, which is 11. All right, so we just converted the mixed number one and five six to an improper fraction of 11 over six. Now let's go ahead and write 12 as an improper fraction as well. To write whole numbers in, as improper fractions, you simply place them over one. Again, 12 divided by one is just 12. All right, so now that we've written both of these as improper fractions, all we have to do is multiply these two fractions together. And before we do this multiplication, it's important to try to reduce this as much as possible in an effort to one, solve the problem more quickly, and two, reduce the amount of mistakes we're gonna make by doing a lot of multiplication. So you should see that you can reduce this via cross reduction. You can say six goes into six one time, six goes into 12 two times. So this becomes 11 over one times two over one. What is 11 over one? 11 divided by one is just 11. What is two divided by one? Two divided by one is just two. What is 11 times two? That is 22. All right, so the weight of the 12 boxes of screws is A, 22 pounds. Again, for the ASVAB, you have to be able to work with fractions, which includes converting fraction, uh, whole numbers to fractions as well as mixed numbers to fractions. All right, so that is that one. All right, so number two says the lengths of the sides of a triangle are one third the lengths of the sides of a similar triangle. If the side of the larger triangle is 24 inches, how long is the corresponding side of the smaller triangle? So for this problem, we're comparing the side lengths of two similar triangles. And if it's helpful, you can quickly make a sketch of those two similar triangles. Again, we have one big triangle, which I'm gonna draw over here. And then we have another smaller, albeit similar triangle, which I'll draw over here. We're told that 
one of the sides of the larger triangle is 24 inches. So I'm going to say that this side is 24 inches. And according to the problem, we want to know how long the corresponding side of the smaller triangle is. Well, corresponding means same side. So we're looking at this side of the larger triangle. That means we're going to be looking at this side of the smaller triangle. And since we don't know how long this side is, we can represent that with the letter variable x. All right, so let's work on solving for x. We're going to use this piece of information right here to figure that out. The side length of this smaller triangle is one third the side length of this larger triangle. So let's represent that algebraically. The side length of this smaller triangle, which is x, is equal to one third the side length of the larger triangle, which we know is 24. So by performing this math right here, notably one third times 24, we'll figure out how long this side of the smaller triangle is. So let's go ahead and work on doing that. As you can see, we have x equals one third times 24. Again, we're multiplying a fraction by a whole number. So the first thing you want to do here is rewrite 24 as a fraction by placing it over one. This will enable you to multiply these two things together. Again, when you multiply fractions, you just multiply straight across. So this becomes x equals one times 24 over three times one. Uh, one times 24 is 24. Three times one is three. What is 24 divided by three? It is eight. So as we can see, the length of the corresponding side of this smaller triangle is B, eight inches long. All right, so that is how you deal with similar figures. So number three says the odds of rolling a certain number on a single dice is one chance in six rolls. During a game, someone rolled three sixes. According to the odds, how many times must that person have rolled the dice in total? All right, so we know our odds of getting a six are one out of every six rolls. Well, what's that actually look like? Uh, that means that you have to physically roll the dice six times to get a six just once. And that can look like this. We roll once, we don't get a six. We roll twice, we don't get a six. We roll a third time, we don't get a six. On our, on our fourth roll, we get a six. Fifth roll, no six. Sixth roll, no six. So as you can see, out of these six rolls right here, we got a six once. Well, those are our odds. And we know that they rolled three sixes. So this must have occurred at least three times. So for instance, let's say they rolled again. They didn't get a six. They rolled again, didn't get a six. Rolled again, got a six. Rolled again, didn't get a six. Didn't get a six. Didn't get a six. As you can see here, they got a six, one, once out of six attempts. All right, so let's do this one more time. Let's say they rolled again, didn't get a six, rolled again, didn't get a six, did not get a six, did not get a six, did not get a six, and then finally they got a six. Here, their odds of getting this six are once out of every six rolls. Question is, how many rolls did it take them to get these three sixes? Let's just count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So in order to get in order to get three sixes, they clearly had to roll the dice eighteen times. So the correct answer to this one is D eighteen. All right. So uh, number four here says. To mail a package, it costs $5 plus an additional $0.05 cents for every ounce a package weighs over 6 ounces. If a package weighs 2 pounds and 4 ounces, then how much will it cost to mail it? All right, so for this problem, uh, we first have to figure out how much this package weighs in terms of just ounces. And then after that, we're going to have to figure out what $0.05 cents times its weight is over six ounces. So let's start by converting the package weight to just be in terms of ounces. We know according to the problem that our package weighs two pounds and 
four ounces. All right, let's convert this to be just in terms of ounces. And that's pretty easy to do. For the ASVAB and PiCat, you have to know some very simple conversions such as inches to feet. And you also have to know how to convert uh, pounds and ounces. In one pound, there are 16 ounces. So to convert this to be just in terms of ounces, we're gonna take our two pounds and we're gonna multiply that by 16. Uh, two times six, of course, is 12, carry a one. One times two is two plus one is three. So uh, in other words, our package, which is two pounds and four ounces, is 32 ounces plus four ounces. Again, this is our two pounds. This is our four ounces or 36 ounces. All right. So now let's get back to this problem. It says uh, it costs an additional five cents for every ounce a package weighs over six ounces. Well, our package weighs 36 ounces. And how many ounces is that more than six ounces? Well, let's just subtract six from it. 36 minus six is 30. So our package is 30 ounces over this six ounce limit where we get that additional charge. And according to the problem, we get charged an additional five cents for every ounce our package is over 30 ounces. Our package is 30 ounces over that limit. So we're gonna take 30 and we're gonna multiply that by 0.05. All right, so let's go ahead and work this out. As you can see, we're multiplying a whole number by a decimal to make this math a little bit easier to do. Let's go ahead and take this decimal in 0.05 and shift it one, two times to the right like that, such that this problem becomes 30 times five. And once we work this out, we'll take the two decimals that we moved to the right here, and we'll take those decimals and move them back into the left. So we have five times zero, which is zero, five times three, which is 15. Move our two decimals back into the left, one, two. So in other words, for the 30 ounces that our package weighs more than the six ounce limit, we're gonna be charged an additional dollar 50. So to find out how much it costs to mail our package in total, we have a $5 flat rate plus a surcharge of $1.50 because our package is 30 ounces more than the six ounce limit. If we add those together, we can figure out how much it costs to mail our package in total. Zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus five is five. Drop down our decimal in place. Five plus one is six. So as you can see, it's gonna cost us a total of $6.50 to mail our package. All right, so that is that one. So number five says, if the population of the state of California decreased by 10% over the course of two years, then its new population is what percentage of its old one? So for a problem like this, the best approach you can take is to assign some numbers that are very easy to work with uh, as you uh, solve this one. So for instance, I'm going to say the original population of California had 100 people. Why did I pick 100 people? Because 100 is a very easy number to work with. All right, so according to the problem, its population decreased by 10% over two years. So that means it went from 100 and it decreased by 10%. Well, we have to figure out what 10% of 100 is to figure out the number amount by which it decreased. So that's actually pretty easy to do. We'll take 100, we'll multiply it by 10%, which in decimal form is 0.1. So we have 100 times 0.1. Since we're multiplying a whole number by a decimal, we wanna shift that decimal uh, one place to the right in this case to get rid of it. This becomes 100 times one, albeit with one decimal to move back into the left at the end when we're done. Let's go ahead and work this out now. One times zero is zero, one times zero is zero, one times one is one. Move our decimal back in one place. 
So we can see that 10% of 100 is 10. In other words, it declined by 10 people. Uh, so it went from 100 people minus 10 people to be 90 people. All right. Question is this. Uh, what percentage is this of its old population? So that's very easy to figure out. We'll take 90, which is its new population. We'll put that over 100, which is its old population. We can cross out these zeros. This becomes 9 over 10. What is 9 tenths as a percent? 9 tenths as a percent is 90%. So the correct answer to this one is C. Its new population is 90% of its old population. All right, that's all there is to that one. All you have to do is pick easy numbers to work with. Uh, do exactly what the problem says, notably subtract 10% from the original population, and then figure out what its new population is in terms of its old population. Nothing more to it than that. Number six says, before the holidays, a jewelry store had four gold necklaces on sale for $400 each and 12 silver necklaces on sale for $150 each. After the holidays, only one gold necklace and six silver necklaces were left in the store for sale. In terms of dollars, what was the ratio of the sales of gold necklaces to silver necklaces? All right, so in this case, we're comparing two things as a ratio, and you can simply use the word two to make that comparison. What are we comparing more specifically? The sales in terms of dollars of gold necklaces to the sales in terms of dollars of silver necklaces. Well, let's ask ourselves this question. How many gold necklaces were sold? There's one left in the store and four were on sale. So that means three gold necklaces were uh, sold. And how much did they cost each? They each cost $400. So that's going to be three times 400. This will give us the dollar amount of the gold necklaces that were sold. Let's do the same thing for silver necklaces. Uh, before, there were 12 necklaces, 12 silver necklaces on sale for $150 each. After the holidays, there were only six left. So that means six were sold. So we're going to take six. How much do those silver necklaces cost each? They're $150 a piece. All right, so by figuring this out, we'll know what the ratio of the sales of gold necklaces were in terms of dollars compared to the sales of silver necklaces in terms of dollars. So let's go ahead and work this out. This isn't as hard to do as you think. Over here, we have 400 times three. If you want, we can work that off to the side. We have 400 times three. Zero times uh, three is zero. Zero times three is zero. Four times three is 12. So over here, we have 1,200. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for six times 150. This becomes 150 times six. Uh, six times zero is zero. Six times five is 30. So bring down a zero, carry a three. Six times one is uh, six plus three is nine. So $1,200 worth of gold necklaces were sold and $900 worth of silver necklaces were sold. If we want to make this math a little bit easier to work with, we can cross out these corresponding zeros. Can we have two zeros over here, two zeros over here? Let's get rid of them. Cross those two out, cross those two out. So you can see that this reduces to be a ratio of 12 to 9. And do 12 and 9 have any common factors that you can think of? Well, I know 3 goes into both 12 and 9. So let's divide both 12 and 9 by a common factor of 3. 12 divided by 3 is 4. 9 divided by 3 is 3. So in terms of dollars, the ratio of the sales of gold necklaces to silver necklaces was 4 to 3. And as we can see, that is answer choice. Uh, number seven says the price of buffalo mozzarella is $4.90 per pound in the supermarket. This is 140% of its cost in Italy. 
how much would it cost per pound to purchase the Buffalo mozzarella in Italy? All right, so let's get started with this problem. Thankfully enough, problems like this one tell you exactly what operations to perform. We know that the price of Buffalo mozzarella is $4.90 per pound. According to the problem, this is, this $4.90 is. In math, we typically associate the word is with equal. So we know 490 equals 140% of its cost in Italy. Well, let's go ahead and express this percent in decimal form. To express 140% in decimal form, it's going to be 1.4. So 490 is 1.4 of its cost in Italy. Well, in math, we associate of with multiplication. So this is 1.4 times its cost in Italy. We do not know how much buffalo mozzarella cost in Italy. In fact, that's what we're being asked to figure out. So that is an unknown value. And in mathematics, you can express unknown values with letter variables. So let's refer to the cost of this buffalo mozzarella in Italy with the letter variable C. Uh, so if we complete this equation here, it's uh, 490 is equals 140%, which is 1.4 in decimal form of multiplication. It's cost in Italy, which is unknown. So that we're going to represent that with the letter variable C. So altogether, we have 490 equals 1.4 C. As you can see, we're going to be solving for the letter variable C, which refers to the cost of buffalo mozzarella in Italy. And that's all we have to do in this case. So uh, this is a one-step equation. Let's go ahead and get C by itself by dividing both sides by 1.4. This crosses out over here, leaving you with just C on this side. And we should see that we have this left on this left side of the equation, notably 490 divided by 1.4. I'm going to go ahead and flip-flop this. Uh, because in math, people, people typically write the variable for which they're solving on the left. So this is C equals 490 over 1.4. Now we actually have to perform this long division to find out what C is. And I'm going to do that off to the side because sometimes division involving decimals can get a little messy. We would read this as 490 divided by 1.4. As far as dividing decimals goes, if you have a decimal outside this division bracket, you have to shift that decimal to the right, however many times it takes to clear it. So in 1.4, we're going to shift the decimal once to rewrite that as 14. And we're going to shift the decimal inside the division bracket a corresponding number of times. So that's going to shift one time to the right to be 49. All right, so now we're doing 49 divided by 14. And let's think about this. Uh, 14 times 1 would be 14. 14 times 2 would be uh, 28. What about 14 times 3? What's that give us? Uh, 4 times 3 is 12. Carry a 1. 3 times, three times 1 is 3 plus 1 is 4. So 14 times three will give us 42. If we did it times four, that would be greater than 49. So 14 times three is 42. Let's subtract that out. Uh, nine minus two is gonna be seven. Four minus four is nothing. All right, in order to continue, uh, we have to add our decimal here, which then we're gonna bring up into our answer. And I'm gonna add a couple of zero placeholders so that I can drop them down in order to keep doing this long division. So I'm gonna drop down a zero right here. Now the question becomes this, how many times does 14 go into 70 without going over? Well, 14 times seven is gonna be greater than 70. So we know we can look at our answer choices and figure this out. 14 times two is 28, that's too small. 14 times seven is gonna be greater than 70, that's too big. So I'm going to say it's going to go into it five times. Uh, let's do that. 14 times five. 
4 times 5, of course, is 20, carry our 2. 5 times 1 is 5 plus 2 is 7. So as we can see, 14 times 5 is exactly 70. 70 minus 70 is 0. Since we hit this 0, we know we're done. So we know that C is 3.5, which is the same thing as $3.50. So in other words, if Buffalo mozzarella costs $4.90 in the store, then it's going to cost $3.50 per pound in Italy. So number eight says, if the perimeter of a square field is 84 feet, then what is the area of the field? So let's think our way through this one. And if you watch my video on finding the area and perimeter of quadrant laterals, you'll know that if you know the perimeter of a square, you can easily find its area. Likewise, if you know the area of a square, you can easily find its perimeter. And here's why. To find the perimeter of a square, you simply add up all of its sides. In other words, you do side plus side plus side plus side. Again, squares have four sides. In other words, the perimeter of a square is 4s. You should know that formula already. How do you find the area of a square? The area of a square is side times side or area equals one of its sides squared. Well, let's think about these two formulas in regard to the information that we're given. We're told that we have a square that has a perimeter of 84 feet. And if it's helpful, we can quickly sketch a square. What's one property of squares that you learn about in elementary school? Well, you learn more often than not that squares have equal sides. That is to say this side's equal to that side, that side's equal to that side, and that side's equal to that side. Uh, we don't know the side lengths of this square, but we do know that if I say this side's S, that means this side's S, this side must also be S, and this side must also be S. All right, so what's more, we also know that the perimeter of this square is 84. So let's go back to this formula right here. To find the perimeter of a square, we simply add up all of its sides, which is 4. S. We know P in this case has to be 84. So this becomes 84 equals 4S. If we solve this equation for S, we'll figure out how long the sides of our square are. So let's divide both sides by 4 now to get S by itself. This crosses out, leaving you with just S on this side. What is 84 divided by 4? You should be able to do that just by looking at it. 8 divided by 4 is 2. 4 divided by 4 is 1. So we know that S in this case is 21. In other words, we have a square that looks like this. We have a square in which all the sides are 21 feet. And how do you find the area of a square where the sides are all 21 feet? Then you just follow this formula right here. Area of a square equals side times side. In this case, we know the sides of our square are 21 feet, so that's going to be 21 times 21. What is 21 times 21? If you can't do that in your head, you can always do it off to the side. I'm going to do that right here. 21 times 21. 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 1 is 2. Before we start multiplication with this 2, we have to bring in a 0 placeholder. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. Let's add these together. Uh, 1 plus nothing is 1. 2 plus 2 is 4. 4 plus nothing is 4. So the area of this square that has a perimeter of 84 feet is 441 uh, square feet. And that is answer choice D. All right, number 9 says a square has a perimeter of 88 feet. If that square doubles in area, then how many square feet will it be now? All right, so uh, first let's talk about what we have. We have a square that has a perimeter, our P, of 88 feet. And according to this problem, that square gets bigger. As a matter of fact, it doubles in terms of its area. And we want to know 
how much square feet it will now cover. So in other words, we have to know that square feet is in regard to area. So we want to figure out the area of this new square. So let's see how we're going to do that. Uh, the first thing we should do is find the area of this smaller square. And how are we going to do that given that we only have its perimeter? Well, as we just saw, if we know the perimeter of a square, we can easily find its area. But the first thing we have to do is figure out how long each of the sides of this square is. And again, in squares, all the sides are equal. How are we going to do that? Well, we know the perimeter of this smaller square is 88 feet. We also know that the perimeter formula for a square is perimeter equals S plus S plus S plus S, or perimeter equals 4S, where S refers to the side length of the square. And in squares, all of those are equal. So that's S, that's S, and that is S there and there. So we know what its perimeter is, so we can go ahead and plug that in right here. This becomes 88 equals 4s. Let's solve for s now by dividing both sides by 4. This crosses out, leaving with just s on this side. Uh, what is 88 divided by 4? You should be able to do this one just by looking at it. 8 divided by 4 is 2. 8 divided by 4 is 2, so we know s is 22. All right, so in other words, uh, we have a square that looks like this. We have a square that has sides that are 22 feet long. Now, we know there's a relationship between these two squares. We know that uh, this bigger square has twice the area of this smaller square. In other words, once we figure out what the area of this smaller square is, we can double that to figure out what the area of this bigger square is. So our next task is to figure out what the area of this smaller square is. And we should know from the previous question that to find the area of a square, it's side times side. In this case, we know our side lengths are 22 feet. So that's gonna be 22 times 22. And if you need to, you can work that off to the side here. 22 times 22. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 2 is 4. Before we start multiplication with that 2, bring down a 0 placeholder. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 plus nothing is 4. 4 plus 4 is 8. 4 plus nothing is 4. So the area of our smaller square is 484. According to the problem, the area of this larger square is twice the area of the smaller square. So to find the area of our larger square, we're simply going to take 484 and we're going to multiply it by 2. And let's do that off to the side so as not to make any mistakes. We have 484 times 2. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16, so bring down a 6, carry a 1. 4 times 2 is 8, uh, plus 1 is 9. So the area of our larger square is 968 uh, square feet. And we can see that that is answer choice C. So number 10 says, because of inflation, a landlord has decided to increase rent by 8.5%. If he charges $1,250 a month for rent now, then how much will he charge for rent when it increases? All right, so to find the new amount that he's going to be charging for rent, we're going to take the old amount that he was charging, and to that, we're going to add 8.5% of the old amount. So that's going to be... Uh, 8.5% times the old amount, but instead of doing 8.5% times the old amount, we're going to have to express that 8.5% in decimal form. 8.5% uh, in decimal form is 0 0.085. So this is going to be 0 0.085 times the old amount of rent. So let's go ahead and plug these things in. We know his original amount of rent was twelve fifty, and that's going to be twelve fifty plus point zero eight five times twelve fifty. All right, this problem is actually very easy to do. The hardest part is doing 
uh, this multiplication here and this addition here. But that said, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we're going to start by doing 1250 times 0 0.085. As you can see, we're multiplying a decimal by a whole number. In order to do this math, we're going to clear this decimal by shifting it to the right. In this case, we're going to shift it to the right one, two, three times. And we're going to rewrite this such that it becomes this problem. 1250 times 85, albeit with three decimals to shift back into the left at the end. Again, we shift it, those decimals to the right. Here, we're going to shift them back into the left once we're done doing this math. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we have 0 times 5, which is 0. 5 times 5, which is 25. Carry a 2. 5 times 2 is 10. Plus 2 is 12. So bring down a 2. Carry a 1. 1 times 5 is 5. Plus 1 is 6. Before we start multiplication with this 8, we have to bring in a 0 placeholder. 8 times 0 is 0. 8 times 5 is 40. So bring down a 0. Carry a 4. 8 times 2 is 16, plus 4 is 20, so bring down a 0, carry a 2. 8 times 1 is 8, plus 2 is 10. All right, let's add these together now. 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 5 is 5. 0 plus 2 is 2. Uh, 6 plus 0 is 6. One, or 0 plus nothing is 0. 1 plus nothing is 1. Bring in our three decimals. 1, 2, 3. All right, so we can see that this is going to become 1250 plus uh, 106.25. And let's go ahead and work that off to the side so as not to make any mistakes. Again, right here we have 1250 plus 106.25. And as you can see, we're now adding a number that includes a decimal to a number that doesn't include a decimal. So how are we going to proceed? Well, we can add a decimal here and a couple of zeros here. Again, 1250.00 is just the same thing as 1250. All right, now that we've done that, we can go ahead and add accordingly. 0 plus 5 is 5. 0 plus 2 is 2. Drop down our decimal in place. 6 plus 0 is 6. 5 plus 0 is 5. Uh, 2 plus 1 is 3. 1 plus nothing is 1. So we can see that an 8.5% increase in rent uh, makes the new rent 1356.25, which we can see is uh, answer choice B. All right, so that is that one. So number 11 says, if the ratio of the sides of two squares is two to one, what is the ratio of their perimeters? So in this case, uh, you should know that we're comparing uh, two squares, one of which is twice as big as the other one. So let's go ahead and quickly sketch out two squares here. Here's our big square, and here is our smaller square. And we're told, according to the problem, that the ratio of the sides of these two squares is 2 to 1. Well, let's just get this out of the way. We already know some basic properties of squares, notably that squares all have equal sides, which these hash marks represent. Question is this, what is the side length of this square and what is the side length of this square? Well, that's something that you have to pick in order to answer this question. And you have to pick numbers such that this side length has a ratio of two to one to this side length. Well, what number can you pick to make that very easy to do? I can let this be two and this be one. What is the ratio of this side length to this side length? Clearly it's two to one. All right, so now that we have that out of the way, we have to compare their perimeter. So in other words, now we're gonna have to find the perimeter of both of these squares. And let's go ahead and just label this very quickly. We know that all the sides are equal. So if that side's two, all these other sides are two. Of that side's one, all these other sides are one. How do we find the perimeter of squares? Well, we simply add up all their sides. In other words, it's S plus S plus S plus S. And that's going to be the case for this square as well. It's going to be S plus S plus S plus S. What is the side length of this square? 
it's two, so this is gonna be two plus two plus two plus two. What is the side length of this square? It's one, so that's gonna be one plus one plus one plus one. All right, let's add those things up so we can get their perimeters. Two plus two is four, plus two is six, plus two is eight. The perimeter of this bigger square is eight. What is the perimeter of this small square? One plus one is two, plus one is three, plus one is four. All right, so we know this big square has a perimeter of eight. This small square has a perimeter of four. What is the ratio of their perimeters? Well, you could say that these two squares, the perimeter of these two squares have a ratio of eight to four. That would be correct, right? Unfortunately, that's not one of our answer choices, and here's why. Well, I can reduce this eight and this four by a common factor of four. Uh, eight divided by four, of course, is two. Four divided by four is one. So the ratio of these of the perimeters of these two squares is clearly two to one. So the answer is A, two to one. All right, so number 12 says a security guard makes $8 per hour working in a gatehouse. Because the security guard was feeling sick, they went home early after working from 8, 10 a.m. to 11, 40 a.m. How much did they earn that day? All right, so the first thing you have to figure out is how much time elapsed between 8, 10 a.m. and 11, 40 a.m. that day. That's actually pretty easy to do. You can do this. 8, 10 to 9, 10 is one hour. 9, 10 to 10, 10 is another hour. 10, 10 to 11, 10 is another hour. And then finally, from 11.10 to 11.40 is 30 minutes. So in total, this guard spent three hours and 30 minutes at work. And if he makes, or if he or she makes $8 per hour, we want to know how much they earn that day. Well, this part's very easy. They work three hours and they make $8 an hour. That's simply eight times three. Eight times three is 24. So for the three hours that they worked, they made $24. Well, what about this 30 minutes that they worked? That's a little bit harder to figure out, but you should know that 30 minutes is half an hour. And how do you know that? Well, there are 60 minutes in an hour. If we place 30 minutes over 60 minutes, we can see that this reduces to one half. All right, so they worked half of an hour. What is eight times one half? Eight times one half is four. So for this half of an hour, they made $4. So in total, they made $24 plus $4. In other words, for the day, they made $28, which is answer choice D. So number 13 says, Michael purchased a pair of jeans for $22.05. If that included 5% sales tax, then what was the actual price of the jeans before sales tax was applied? All right. So for this one, uh, you're going to have to use the formula to calculate uh, the total amount of a purchase that includes sales tax. And I just like to use this formula. Total amount is equal to the original amount plus the tax amount times the original amount. All right, we happen to know what a few of these things are. We know the total amount that he spent on the jeans that included tax was 2205. So that is our total amount. Let's go ahead and plug that in accordingly. So he spent 2205. What is the tax amount? We're told that there was 5% sales tax. And of course, we're always going to express percents in decimal form. The decimal equivalent of 5% is 0 0.05. All right, so this becomes original amount, which we don't know, plus the tax amount, which is 5%. 
in decimal form as 0 0.05 times the original amount, which we do not know. All right, so we're trying to solve this equation for the original amount or the original price of these genes. And how are we going to do that? Well, this next step is very, very important, and this is where most people would get lost. So what we're going to do here is we're going to factor out this original amount. So that's going to be original amount factored out, which is going to leave us with 1 plus 0 0.05 in parentheses. So we factored out that original amount. Now to solve for original amount, we can simplify this to make it a little bit easier. We have 2205 equals the original amount uh, times, what's one plus 0.05? One plus 0.05 is 1.05. All right, so now to solve for original amount, we're just gonna divide both sides by 1.05. This crosses out here, leaving with you leaving you with the original amount on this side. As you can see, the original amount is going to be 22.05 divided by 1.05. And since I can't do that math in my head, I'm going to have to do that off to the side again. We read this as 22.05 divided by 1.05. And here we're dividing decimals. And since there's a decimal outside this division bracket, we have to shift the decimal one, two times to the right to clear it to make that 105. And as I've said in this video already, you're going to have to shift the decimal inside the division bracket a corresponding number of times. So that's going to be one, two times here to make that 2205. All right, so now that we've cleared those things, we can go ahead and proceed with this long division. We start by asking ourselves, how many times does 105 go into two? It doesn't. How many times does 105 go into 22? It doesn't. How many times does 105 go into 220 without going over? Well, that's going to be two times. And we can do this off to the side if you need to see it. 105 times 2. 5 times 2 is 10, so bring down a 0, carry a 1. 2 times 0 is 0, plus 1 is 1. 2 times 1 is 2. So 105 times 2 is 210. Let's subtract this out. 0 minus 0 is 0. Uh, 2 minus 1 is 1. 2 minus 2 is nothing. We drop down our 5. How many times does 105 go into 105 without going over? That's going to be 1 time. 105 times 105 is 105. 105 minus 105 is 0. Since we hit this remainder of 0, we know we're done. In other words, the original amount of these genes which I'm going to write on the left here, was $21, which we can see as answer choice B. All right, kind of a difficult problem. As a matter of fact, I find those problems very difficult personally. So if you struggled with that one, just bear in mind that you're not alone. All right, so uh, number 14 says, if a five-foot vertical pole cast a three-foot shadow and a nearby tree cast a 20-foot shadow, then how tall is the tree? So for problems like this one, it's always going to be helpful to make quick sketches. Let me go ahead and move down a little bit so we can have more room to work with here. We know we have a pole that is five feet tall. And according to the problem, it cast a shadow that is three feet long. Next to the pole, we have a tree. And according to the problem, that tree cast a shadow that is 20 feet long. That said, we don't know how tall the tree is. As a matter of fact, that's what we're being asked to figure out. So in math, you can always represent unknown values with letter variables. So I'm going to refer to the height of this tree with the letter variable x. And this should look pretty similar to something we did previously. If you enclose these figures real quickly, you can see that we have a pair of similar right triangles. And when you have a pair of similar figures, you can use ratios to figure out any missing sides. So I can say that the height of this tree is five feet. 
and the length of its shadow is three feet, that's going to be equal to uh, the height of this tree, which is X feet, compared to the length of its shadow, which is 20 feet. And by solving this ratio for X, we'll know the height of our tree. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, when you solve ratios, you just cross multiply. So this becomes three times X, which is three X. And this becomes uh, five times 20, uh, three X equals, what is five times 20? It is 100. You should know that one without having to do the work off to the side. Uh, to solve for x, we're going to go ahead and divide both sides by 3. This crosses out, leaving you with just x on this side. And some of you probably know what this is in terms of an answer right here. But that said, let's go ahead and work it out together since this one's a little bit more challenging than the other ones. Right here, we have 100 divided by 3. So that looks like this in long division. 100 divided by 3. We perform this long division by uh, starting with this question. How many times does 3 go into 1? It doesn't. How many times does 3 go into 10 without going over? Well, that's going to be 3 times since 3 times 3 is 9. 10 minus 9 is 1. And of course, we drop down this 0. Now we ask ourselves, how many times does 3 go into 10 without going over? Of course, that's going to be 3 times, since 3 times 3 is 9. And we've run out of numbers to work with. Again, 10 minus 9 is 1. We've run out, run out of numbers to drop down, right? So what we can do is this. Uh, we can say that this tree is 33 feet and one third uh, tall. And how do I get that one third? Well, we know that when we did this long division, we had 33 with a remainder of one over three. All right, so that's how I got that one third. So this tree is 33 and one third feet tall, which is answer choice B. All right, so number 15 says, Anderson has two rectangular boxes. The first box has a height that is twice the height of the second box. If the lengths and widths of both boxes are the same, then how much more volume does the first box have than the second box? So for this question, we're comparing the volume of two boxes. And what are boxes? Well, rectangular boxes are rectangular prisms. And how do you find the volume of a rectangular prism? It's actually pretty easy. You do length times width times height. And we're going to do that twice since we're comparing the volume of two rectangular prisms. All right, so let's go ahead and start figuring this one out. Uh, we're told that the first box has twice the height of the second box. And the lengths and widths of the boxes are the same. Well, we're not given any of those values. So let's go ahead and plug them in ourselves. So I'm going to say that uh, this second box has a length of 4, a width of 5, and a height of 10. Again, I just picked those values out of thin air. All right. Now, let's go ahead and use the word problems stipulations about these two boxes to figure out what the length, width, and height of this first box is. Well, we're told right here that the lengths and widths of the two boxes are the same. So these two values are going to be the same over here. So this one's going to have a length of 4 and a width of 5. That said, we're told that this first box has a height that is twice the height of the second box. So if this one has a height of 10, what is twice of 10? Well, 2 times 10 is 20. So this one has a height of 20. All right, so now that we've done that, let's go ahead and find the volume of these boxes and compare them. I'm going to start with this second box since it's a little bit easier. Uh, 4 times 5, of course, is 20. So we have 20 times 10. Uh, what is 20 times 10? 20 times 10 is 200. So the volume of this second and smaller box is 200. 
what is the volume of this first box? Well, we have four times five, which again is 20. And that becomes 20 times 20. What is 20 times 20? Well, two times two would be four. Therefore, 20 times 20 is going to be 400. What do we notice about their volumes? The volume of this first box is 400, which is twice the volume of the second box, which is 200. So to answer this one, A, uh, the volume of the first box is twice the volume of the second box. All right, so that was that one. All right, so number 16 says a train goes twice as fast downhill as it can go uphill and two thirds as fast uphill as it can go on level ground. If it goes 120 miles per hour downhill, how long will it take to travel 45 miles on flat land? So as you read through this problem, you should recognize that it has all the elements of the distance formula. Right here, we're told it goes 120 miles per hour downhill. Well, 120 miles per hour is a rate of speed. How long will it take is in reference to time and to travel a distance of 45 miles. 45 miles is a distance. So in other words, we're probably gonna have to use the distance formula in one way or another to figure this one out. In case you forgot, the distance formula describes the relationship between distance, rate, and time. Specifically, it says distance is equal to rate times time. As long as you know two of these variables, you can always figure out what the third one is. Well, what do we have in this case? We're being asked to figure out how long it will take to travel. How long is in reference to T? So we're going to be solving this distance formula for T to travel 45 miles. 45 miles, of course, is in reference to distance. So we know D is going to be 45. And we're given this rate of 120 miles per hour. Well, this is a rate, but it's the rate of the train as it goes downhill. And we want to know the rate of the train as it goes across flat land. So we can't use this 120 miles per hour per se. So let's fill this in. We know the train's going 45 miles. Uh, we know its rate is 120 miles per hour downhill, but we're going to have to convert that downhill rate to be in terms of a rate across flat land. So I'm going to put a little asterisk there to remind myself that I have to do a conversion to figure that out. And of course, as I said just a few minutes ago, we're going to be solving this distance formula for T. All right, so let's talk about uh, the rate of this train. As I read the problem, you notice that it has a different rate depending on the type of terrain it goes across. It goes across level ground, uphill, and downhill at varying rates. And we don't know any of those rates just yet. So I'm gonna say it goes X miles per hour across level ground. Well, according to the problem, it goes two thirds as fast uphill as it goes across level ground. So that means it goes two thirds of X miles per hour uphill. And then finally, it says it goes twice as fast downhill as it can go uphill. So that would be two times its uphill rate, which is two thirds X. All right, so um, now you can see that there is a relationship between the rate of the train across level ground, uphill and downhill. Let's go ahead and figure those out. And I'm going to start by simplifying what we have down here for this downhill part of the question. Again, right here, we have two times two over three X. I want to reduce this as much as possible. So I'm going to place this two over one, and I'm just going to multiply these two things together. Uh, this is going to become two times two, which is four, one times three, which is three. So this is four over three X. So in other words, uh, if the train goes X miles per hour across level ground, that means it goes four thirds of X miles per hour downhill. And using that information, we can now make a conversion to figure out what this rate is. All right, so we're told that the train goes 
120 miles per hour downhill. All right, so that's going to be 120 miles per hour is equal to four thirds of X, where X is the speed of the train across level ground. If we solve this for X, we'll know how fast this train goes across level ground. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this down here because it's going to take some work to do that. So of course, I want to get rid of this four thirds in front of my X. So I'm going to multiply it by its reciprocal, notably by three over four. This will cross out here and here, leaving me with just X on this side. And now I got to do uh, three over four times 120. And of course I can place 120 over one to work this out. Now I'm just multiplying two fractions. That said, I can reduce this uh, to make the math a little bit easier. I can say four goes into four one time. Four goes into 12 three times. So four goes into 120 30 times. So this becomes three over one, which is three times 30 over one, which is 30. Three times 30 is 90. In other words, if this train goes 120 miles per hour downhill, that means it goes 90 miles per hour across uh, level ground. And now we can go ahead and plug that in. This becomes 45 equals, we now know its rate across flat land is 90 times T. Now we can solve for T by dividing both sides by 90. This crosses out here, leaving you with T on this side. Do 45 and 90 have a common factor? They do. Uh, 45 divided by 45 is 1. 90 divided by 45 is 2. So T in this case is 1 half. In other words, it will take this train 1 half of an hour or 30 minutes to crowd to go 45 miles on flat land. So the answer to this one is B, 30 minutes. This is as difficult as the ASVAB and PICAT will get. So if you can do all this work, you should be able to get a perfect score on the test. That said, this is as hard as it gets. All right, so that is it for this video. As always, I hope you found it helpful. And as usual, you're more than welcome to leave feedback in the comment section below. If you want to help my channel out, uh, please consider subscribing to it. In addition, you can also help it out by sharing links to my channel and videos on social media, including on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, that's all I have for you today. And on that note, I'm going to go ahead and cut you loose. Konnichiwa.